You have exotic girls from America, South Africa, Nigerians, Ghanaians, beautiful girls. You've got your other billionaire friends on that yard. And you just want to prove a point that you've got more money. They don't care about how you feel and your sexual enjoyment. You're a foreign import that is going in two days. So they want to do whatever it is they can do in two days. On Hello everyone, Gululego on Culture. Welcome to yet another episode of our channel. Thank you very much for joining us. Shout out to Khaukhelo behind the scenes and Lebukhang Mazambi as well for organizing all of our interviews. Today we have author, award-winning author, activist, business person, oh uh, a celebrity. I wanted oh to call her Jackie Chen so that she can stage a walkout. <laughs> oh, John, this is Jackie. Yeah, Billy John, I have yeah, never yeah. really walked out of an interview. One day you need to walk out. And, then, and journalists have been very mean to me. Hey? Is it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. There, there's many times where I've been invited to an interview and they really ask extremely inappropriate questions. And, and you've I never think, walked out? No, I just keep quiet. It will justify the prices of your books. Yeah. I was listening to a comedian, uh, Michael Blackson, uh, was having a conversation and he revealed that after Chris Rock was slapped, slapped yeah. uh, the prices changed from around $90 to around 435 because it was in demand. People oh. wanted to be the first immediately the week after he was stabbed by Will Smith. People wanted to be, I want to be the first person to see him on the after, show. After yeah, I slept. get it though. You know, I get it because they waited to see the response. Yeah, yeah, what yeah. he will say. What is he going to say about did that? Did he ever say anything? He did say something uh, like, not necessarily significant, which that will be part of his routine. But at the beginning, he knew he had to address it. Yo, I got slapped. Nigga. I got slapped. Yeah. By, he said he got slapped by the corniest rapper in the history of hip-hop music. Aww. Yeah. Well, and then... I think he felt sorry for him. Yeah. The thing is, for, for both of them, it was so awkward because he could not really respond. He could not clap back or fight yeah. back because it would have been messier. Yeah. You know? Uh, but it's, 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 it's paid dividends for him in that... His, his rates went up. Yeah, yeah. yeah, absolutely. And but I don't know what I would honestly do if somebody slapped me on stage. Um, you you need some kind of emotional intelligence to restrict yourself, especially when so many people are watching. Mm -hmm. Um, because when you are alone, you can say, "Ah, now nah, we'll do this." I'll do yeah, that. of course, you can preempt what you would do until but when you're, you're on in that stage moment. Stage and people are watching you, and mm -hmm. you you almost hear the crowd sort of hi like hissed. You know when they're like, <gasps> yeah, yeah, the collective sigh. From yeah, the, crowd. the collective sigh. You almost feel like you want to slap back, but then the eyes in the crowd sort of restrict you as well because mm -hmm. you sort of look at what's happening. You, yeah, I, I don't. And know also, what I, I think do. there's a because uh, you are a content creator too, uh, and your work speaks to people. There's always uh, with all of us, whether we do radio. There's always the moment where, especially if you are self-reflective self -reflective and emotionally intelligent, there's always the part of you that says, did I say some stupid shit that I wasn't aware of? You know, oh, so yeah. in that moment, his, yeah. his self-mechanism maybe is... Kicking in, yeah. yeah. Well, you, maybe I said some wild shit. But then he knows he didn't say anything, yeah. but, you know, maybe he was in that moment. So it's very difficult for him to... But also, I think you, you preempt your own reaction because you know you're going to tell the joke. Like, you're preparing yourself to yeah. tell the joke, right? So you're like, okay, that was the worst case scenario when he slapped me, you yeah. know? But you are waiting for a response at the end of the day. And I think when he was walking up the stage, you sort of like... Uh oh, I crossed the boundaries. Here. Ricky Gervais has said worse things on the Gold Golden Globe Awards yeah. for five consecutive years, and they're not even worse. But it's it's worse in terms of how offensive they are, and they are not offensive if it's within the framework of the art. You yeah. know, I, I I thought that that was being silly, but then I've read his book. Well, I have it somewhere. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. this copy. I had, yeah, you know. So he described himself as a coward, someone who never confronted his father when he was yeah, being abusive. Yeah, so see, yeah, all well, of these things are triggers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And 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 I I could understand it because what when that happened, I had read his book recently, like maybe a month or two before that moment, and I was like, oh, that's the bitch nigga in him coming out. He's trying to be an aggressive guy that is not. Yeah, but in he's that moment. not because he is not. A, he's not an aggressive person. He's just not. I I, I think it, he they just pushed him. And it's been years and yes. years and years and I don't know. Hey, and I, I will not say I condone violence, but 
when I look at Will, I'm like, wow, it was coming. He was going to break at some point because he's been trying to hold so many things in. Mm. He was going to break at some point. Yeah, even if it, Yeah, even if it was at a club or a red carpet or even on a TV show. In Would you not argue that he's breaking at the wrong people because they're not... It, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, breaking do. is breaking. Yeah. You, you break... Anyway, you know, it doesn't matter who is in the room. Mm. Something would have happened. He mm. would have pushed a table. He would have rammed his car into something. He would He would have done something. Mm. It was going to happen. It's just unfortunate that it happened at that moment. And there were so many eyes on him. You know, he could have slapped Jada, for God's sake. You know, at some point, you know. He was. He he's was going to break. He's had multiple opportunities to do that. Not that I condone yeah. that, but yeah. he's had multiple we, we opportunities in done. private to do that. Maybe yeah. he's done it before. Yeah. But anyways, um, best-selling author for your latest book, uh, yes. what does that mean really to people who don't understand what does bestseller mean? So, Besides the title itself, implying that people are, are, are buying your books. It actually really means that. Mm -hmm. It means you have honestly topped the charts. So in South Africa what bookstores do on a weekly basis, right? So this would be bargain books, exclusive books and take a lot and many others. Mm -hmm. They, when a book, a new book comes out, they start monitoring traction and sales on it mm -hmm. consistently. Um, comparing it to maybe the book sales of that week, the top 20 or top 50. And if you get into the top 10, it means you have sold more than any other book in that store, mm -hmm. right? Um, and I just realized this very morning that we went into the top 10 in Namibia, which is crazy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, I'm country. a South African, and, it have, and it, it's something that happens in, in a different country. You're like, oh, wow, damn, um, you have penetrated the continent somehow. Yeah. How does it feel for you personally? I don't know, hey? I'm not really a numbers girl. Yeah. I look at it and I marvel at the work. And I'm like, oh, we actually put in the work. But when it comes to the numbers, I want, I'm more happy when I see people read the work as opposed to taking pictures with the work. Meaning that I would want them to engage me more on the content than just show me that you have bought a book, right? So, yes, you do feel some kind of pride, especially because I'm self-published. I'm not under any publishing house. So I do everything myself mm -hmm. from the marketing, the writing. Obviously, I hire an editor, a proofreader, my graphic designers yeah. and, and illustrators and so forth. But when you see your book top people who have been in the game for 10, 15, 20, 30 years, yeah, yeah, yeah. you know, when you see it penetrate the white community, because it's very difficult to get into those stores. It's not easy. Mm. It's not like you put out the work and automatically people buy. People buy into consistency. People buy into the story. People buy into the quality of writing. People buy into how the books make them feel, their experiences, can they relate? So you can release a book today and somebody is like, oh, well, nice cover, but it means nothing to me and my mm. family or my kids, you know? So when I see the feedback, I do feel a sense of pride to say, okay, great. We have done something that could really help people. Um, when people send me like their reviews and they tell me, how the books have changed their lives or what they're doing to mm. change their lives, then only I realize the quality of work we have produced. It's interesting you mentioned self-publishing. Yeah. Uh, please break it down for us in terms of the cost implications of everything. Oh, and, damn. And also, the, obviously, the, the potential for profit because you're not, being, you're not under a publisher. So one of the, the, the reasons why I decided to self-publish, number one, was... Is it the, the whole series self -published? Yeah, all my books. Oh, nice one. I've got nine books. Sure. And all of them are under my name. Um, so when I first approached publishing houses, this is now back in 2015, 2016, they actually rejected my work. They said, nobody's going to read about blessers. Nobody's going to read about your human trafficking stories. Like, there's no market for your stories. And, I, and as a first-time writer, you're like, huh? These things are happening in the streets. I see these things all the time. I know. You get me. And... And you feel like 
shit, my work will never be seen anywhere. And I said, okay, fine, I'll do it myself. Started asking questions. What do you need? What needs to happen? What's the mm. process? So the first thing that you need is to write. You have to finish that manuscript. You can't say you're going to produce something that does not exist, right? Finish the manuscript, get an editor. So there are different kinds of editors who edit for academics, for business, novels, and um, financial, right? So you get somebody who understands how to edit novels. Those are really easy to find because there's a list of them on social media. If you go to Publishing South Africa, you'll see a list of different mm -hmm. editors. And they will charge you a fee. They charge you a fee per word count. So if your book is big... And you've got, let's say, anything above 75,000 words towards the 200,000, they charge you per word count. Mm -hmm. So we are looking at anything between 15,000 and 40,000. That's steep. That's steep. Uh, yeah. Depending on how big the book is, right? Mm -hmm. And then also, if you need to do research. So when I write my books, because I need a lot of people involved for my research, it means there's traveling involved, there's recordings involved, there are lawyers involved because they need to make sure that we are in agreement, mm. you mean what you say, you sign a non-disclosure agreement, and also trying to avoid lawsuits. You so know? you, but as a self-publisher, you need you, that. You've been able to do that yourself. Yeah. Particularly the part where you protect yourself legally. Yeah. Wow. You have to. Yeah. Because with a publishing house, they have departments. Yeah, I can understand. Yeah, like with you a, know? That's why I'm, I'm, I'm bringing up that point. That yeah. With a publishing house, they would have all that sorted. Because, yeah. of course, they are a brand. Yeah. And there's money to be lost as well. Exactly. You know, with slandering people. But yeah. you, who guided you through that, though? I, nobody really guided me. I actually got into a lawsuit. That's how I learned. <laughs> so, which is another story for another day. Yeah, yeah. But you learn through your experiences, right? So when the Blessed Game came out, there were like three different lawsuits that were hanging on my neck. And thank God those were resolved. Is that the reason why the books are fiction, even though they might be inspired by real stories? Yeah. Yeah. Because this is now where we need to be careful with fiction. You can border on the truth, but also border on reputation. Because some people, you can describe a person as a fictional character, but there, there are some things that will lead to pe real people, especially if they're still affiliated with you. So if I say there's a black man who has dreadlocks who used to own or who owns a beverage company, mm. that's a very clear description. Mm, I don't see how that black man can be able to win a lawsuit he against can. you. He's the only black man who has dreadlocks who owns... Oh, it's very particular. Yeah, it's a it's very, very particular. particular. Uh, yeah, I see what you're saying. As, as soon as I said that, who do you but think... But wouldn't you win? Wouldn't you have, have no. good lawyers to win that? Yeah, you can have good lawyers, but the law is the law. If you, you bridge on those things mm -hmm. and it's e the person is easily identifiable, you can't win. It's a fact. You can't win. The president in 2019 of South Africa is, is, that is, is the a person. Fact. Yeah. You get Without me. even mentioning his yeah, name. Yeah, you don't even have to mention his name. He's the only president. That in, was, in that year. Yeah, no, there was nobody competing with him. He was not, he was not um, fired. Yeah. We, there was no replacement for him. There were no him. two president plus interim it's, in that yeah, year. Yeah, so it's a very clear description. Mm. So even if you write it as fiction and that person says, but you just violated my rights to privacy or my rights to um, any constitutional rights. Let's yeah. put it that way, right? It, is it not them volunteering to be offended by it? Because you not, didn't mention anything. I get it. Like, no, but it's public only... perception. Yeah. It's how it affects him in the public space. So if even if he doesn't care, but the people who work with him, the people, his family, mm -hmm. his associates will have a response to that. So in defending his reputation, they will sue, whether they like it or not. His company might say, okay, we are inciting a lawsuit on your behalf. Mm -hmm. They can do that. How many of those were settled out of court then? 
two. All right. Two. And you you walked away with it with no resentment from that without, without any resentment. No, I understood. I understood. The thing is, you, you can't only seek to want to be right. Mm. If you have infringed, you have infringed. And it's finding common ground and apologizing for it and then moving on. But you can't fight the truth. If it's the truth, it's the truth. Mm. You can't be big-headed about it and say, ah, but it's fixing, ah. Yeah. But there, there are things that are hindering people's lives. So It's very weird because sometimes when you write something that you know is right, is yeah. a true reflection of real With, events yes. that happened. You know, the last thing you want is to lose a case and it appearing as if you were wrong in the first place. Yeah, yeah, that sucks. Because you know you were right. Yeah, you know you were right, but they can also say, but you, you don't have the right to tell my story. Mm. I'll tell it when it's time. Mm. All right, can we go into something different now? Um, obviously, recent trend, Dubai, South African women. Uh, what were your thoughts about that? I mean, you've been speaking about those kind of events uh, for a while now. Um, what were your thoughts about Dubai, South African women, and just maybe critiquing even the South African condition that forces women to go there to make money and the things that are done on South African women when they are there? It may not particularly only be Dubai, but different countries, people pimping themselves for, the, for cash. It's only sad when you see things really happen. I could never ever say, oh yeah, they got what they deserved. Yeah, we, we, we knew about this. Yeah, yeah, great. But you can't be against your own people, especially in their suffering. Being peed on and people leaving their feces on your face and stuff, it's not an exciting thing. Um, it's very dehumanizing. I, um, and I, I don't know why people continue to do stuff like that for money because they, they they i don't think there's any enjoyment in that so we could only say it's money and obviously we we look at a lot of things you look at poverty you look at greed greed is also a big thing some people the girls who go to these things they're not completely poor they have some kind of money somewhere. It's just that greed keeps them going back. They keep continuing doing it because, yes, the first time they hated it, then the second time it's like, oh, okay. Then the third time it's like, oh, but the money is good. So you see yeah. how greed plays into it. But then you look at how society has made slavery comfortable. We condone it. Um, we don't we don't ask ourselves why don't these Arab men do these to their own Arab women? Mm. Why would why, why would it be black women? It goes back to slavery. Our parents, when they were arrested for whatever, 1976, 1952, hundreds, peeing on someone and fornicating on them was sort of torment right it was part of a way to degrade mm. them highest level of humiliation exactly right so they would bring white people would bring crowds of other black people to come watch the act so that that man is demoralized is um, humiliated demasculated, all of it, right? Now we see it, people using it to trade with. And you ask yourself, what other things are being done to dehumanize humans, yeah. black people? As much as we can say, no, but they knew what they were doing, blah, blah, blah. You can't really say much to a person who's hungry. They, yeah, they unfortunately. Will, they, they will do anything when they're hungry. This is now despite the greed, despite everything else. We, we understand how poverty is pushing people to do things, right? The lack of education is pushing people to do a lot of things. Um, child, child-led households are pushing young people to do a lot of things. And this is not only women because it happens to women and men. Mm, interesting. 
So you see all of those things play in these social circles and you're like, wow, if you're forced to sleep with a dog, you're forced to be peed on, you're forced to have orgies with people that were in your right state of mind you wouldn't necessarily do. That is sexual slavery, whether you consented or not. Other people or other girls and boys are kidnapped and forced into that act, right? Others are are in situations where there's a lot of peer pressure in their circle. So in their right minds, they wouldn't do it. But because they're in a different country, they're forced to do it because they fear not be able not be able to come back. Yeah. Do you understand? So you go to Dubai or any other country or province for that matter with a bunch of friends. Yeah. You get there, it's a good time. And yes, you understand that after one one or two rounds of sex or whatever, you will get a portion of whatever is going to be divided, right? But then they increase the stakes by saying, we'll add a yacht on it. We'll add, we'll add this, you'll add that. You are in a different province or country. How, how are you thinking clearly at that time? Because you're thinking, you and you are in Dubai, for an example. These people can have you jailed for whatever. They can plant drugs in your bag. They can plant this. You will not leave that airport, right? These people are rich. It's not like boys with small money. You're thinking about that, that they could do something that could get me into jail somehow. They could make my passport disappear and I could go to jail. You look at the social circle that you're with. You, you, your friends are doing it, so yeah. why not do it? Because they, they're pressurizing you in the background. You end up doing it. The violation of that alone, of sleeping with somebody that you did not intend to sleep with. Then you have got the recording. Did you consent to be recorded having yeah. sex with someone? That's also a violation. That's a criminal violation. Then you've got the many other people that you are forced to sleep with who happen to be in the room. There's no consent to that. So you are saying a person who is trapped has given consent. How? How? Yes, there are people... The question could be, I, I, I get, because you, you're giving us multiple different scenarios. scenarios yes. Right? The, the question would be that when you went to Dubai, when you went to England... What uh, was the intention? We, we see happy. Where were yes, you going? there was intention. Yeah. If you were going there knowing that you were invited to go sleep with the Arab man or whatever man for this, and you know, because now they've got NDAs and contracts on that stipulate what's going to happen, where you're going to go and so forth. Yeah. That is a very clear indication of the intention, right? But for those who do not have a clear indication... Um, <sighs> What is unclear indication? Where where are you going there? You're not a performing musician. You're not invited for an so exchange unclear, at school. It, no, some people so, are very honest. They could say, you're going to sleep with someone, mm. right? So-and-so wants you to come visit, and this is what's going to happen. This is how much money you're going to get, right? You go. You're clear on that. Yeah. But were you told about sleeping with a dog? No. Were you told about sleeping with multiple multiple other people? No. Were you told about how long this is going to happen? Is it three, four, five days? Yeah, the defecation. Yeah, do you see where I'm going with Yeah, this? I see what you're saying. You were clear that you were going to one person. Yeah. That one person was clear that they're going to do this and they're going to pay you this much. Mm. Were, then the other add-ons. What do you think opened the pipeline? Uh, because... Lifestyle. Yeah. Lifestyle. How did we know that those people want us? As as South African women or Southern African women, it might be even happening in Zambia. What what triggered this pipeline from South Africa to Dubai, which that's the destination, and there's fifty thousand or ten thousand US dollars there? Social circles. You see a lot of South Africans who are friends with international people, whether it be influencers, makeup artists, musicians. So if I'm in South Africa and I know for a fact that my South African people enjoy a certain lifestyle, I will introduce them to other people that enjoy the same lifestyle. Mm. And then we'll start going on holidays together. We go to music festivals together. We will go on holidays together. And then on those trips, I'll, in, I'll invite you. 
and tell you, hey, we've got social circles that are like this. Would you be like to be part of it? And then once I come back to South Africa, I tell my friend about it. And then my friend passes it on. So it grows like that. Mm. And then obviously with the invent of technology, you can DM anybody anyway. And, yeah, yeah. And say, sure. hey, are you free on the 27th? We have a boat cruise. Can You can invite four of your friends. I like exotic. You know, people will say, I like exotic girls. You yeah. look beautiful. You look what? That's easy bait. People want a holiday. Yeah. <laughs> like, really? If somebody calls you and say, come to Devon, you will go regardless. Now, somebody says, I'm going to fly you private. I'm going to do this. And you can see it's genuine because they deposit the money. They fly you. They really book a ticket. How many people have left Johannesburg to go to Cape Town and they've never met the people that they, they are talking to online? So now the stakes are higher. And you're like, instead of just getting 10,000 rand, I can go get 100,000 rand. And I'm going on a free holiday. So I, I will go. They will go. They know you're desperate. You will go. Mm. I mean, the pandemic increased a lot of things. People were broke. So any little opportunity to make an extra 10,000 rand, people will do it. Do you think there are significant numbers that are doing that? Or... There's a lot. Because I was about to say, like, maybe... This is, this is the United video. Arabs. It's a whole country. Yeah. And how, how many billionaires are in that? That place has a lot of money. It's richer than Africa. They have more money than all of us. Or more money and more access. And Dubai has access to all the other countries. To go to London, you have to go through Dubai. Mm. To go to the States, to get to some other African countries, you go through Dubai. So they have access to everyone. And they've got the means. And South African girls in particular like foreign guys, regardless. Whether it's Nigerian, Congolese, Canadian, Namibian, Zimbabwean, they like foreign guys. Do you like foreign guys? Khabar? I do. I like See, it, it, it's like fetishes. We, we like accents. We like their body structure. The didn't hear you. We like different things. <laughs> I'm saying I like accents. See, so. accents. It's either you like Italians, Germans, Russians, Ghanaians, Namibians, Kenyans, mm. Nigerians. South African girls do look at foreign guys. What I'm trying to get at actually with this, which is a significant number, is whether or not as we walk around the streets, every third girl you see has ever done shit like that, whether they've gone to a different province, different country, is it prevalent? And then, it's of course, it's tied, it's tied as well into the perception of South African women. What does it say about them, all of this? Or should we look at that as an isolated it's, thing? It's isolated because we can't say all South African girls will do it, you know. Um, and also it's scaling and accessibility. A person who oh, yeah, lives, yeah, a person who lives in a village does not even know the airport. For sure. You know, a person who lives in Joburg, they have more access to different provinces and many other things, right? And they see things. That's where they want to go experience it, right? So they could experience something as small as an orgy here in Johannesburg. And then they're like, oh, damn. If I could do this and get so much, then I can do that with the other people, right? I can confirm that, like, ever since I moved to Joburg, that there are sexual experiences that I never experienced. Exactly. In Cape Town. Even Cape Town is a modern city, yeah. but if you live in townships in Cape Town, you would yeah. not. But then... The reason why Joburg is the way it is, it, it's the richest square mile in Africa. Yeah. Economic Everybody mile. is here. Mm. Before they land, before they go to Cape Town and KZN and all these other provinces, they come to Joburg first. So you meet... All the foreign people here. It's like Cape Town. There's a lot of foreign people. Mm. Um, and whatever fetishes and fantasies they have, they use their money to get that. And it's so unfortunate that, yes, Johannesburg girls want to experience all of it. Boys and girls. If somebody puts money on the table, it's a question of how much. Yeah, I was, I was about to counter-argue, Wuti. Is it not a matter of money and not about the accents and the foreign? No, it's money. It doesn't matter who it, yeah, the who people it, are. Yeah. So even if it is a rich South African, they will do it. Mm. So it doesn't matter who the people are. The question is, can you be bought? And believe you me, everybody has a price. Yeah. Is it possible that, and you've somewhat alluded to it, that not only regular girls with no money go there, even people who are popular go there. Yes, there's popular people. There's, there's people who work in corporate who do it. 
it's not exclusive to just poor people, poor people or influencers or slay queens. It's not. That's why I said money talks. If you if you are a young lawyer, you're still starting out. You're not earning like that other guy. What's that other lawyer? Um, Beruru. Oh yeah, yeah. You're not yeah. earning like him. Is he one of the highest earners of Peru? Yeah, he is. We know what he is. A oh, Talimpofu. You're not yeah. earning like Talimpofu. Yeah. You understand? Oh, Kherinel. Oh, Kherinel. You're not. So you're still doing your first two, three years of your articles and many other things. But your peers are driving Range Rovers. What about the South African entertainers? Uh, that's what I want to get to. They they, are, they look like they have the life. They're no, making but guys, money. We, we, Do you think they also pimp themselves out? Yeah, they are the masters of doing it. <laughs> we all know that South African entertainers don't make money. They make money in drips and drabs. So what will they do for sustainability and consistency? They, they, they do it. And they're the one marketing it. Because they're the one posting the lavish cars, the hotels, the the holidays, the oh, travel. Yeah, yeah. They're the ones who started it. Yeah, I remember Wuti, the only few times or the first few times I've seen black people uh, going to Bali or Dubai. They're are the black ones posting. Yeah, black entertainers are the one who promote lifestyle, whether we like it or not. Influencing started two, four, five years ago for South Africans. Yeah. But who, who was there before? Who influenced culture? Musicians, right? And, and actors. They drive how we perceive things. So when they post a watch, we all want the watch. When they post a lipstick, we all want a lipstick. When they post a jacket, we want the jacket. Mm. Simple. And then, Would it go? I mean, they have some form of income that they make, but how even many? though it's in drips and drabs. And yes, of course, the top one percent makes the most money, yes. and then the rest is is fucked. But do you think it would go as far as defecation with them? Would you not yes. have that sense of self pride? Oh please, know? man! For fuck! No, oh, please! Wow. Oh please! 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 Nobody, no one is immune to money. No one is immune to desires. No one is immune to ego because once your ego gets knocked, you will find sources to repair it, which is money. And if, for an example, there's so many artists who have gone through the dips, for an example, you have one hit this year, next yeah. year you don't have a hit. What are you doing that whole year? No album, no EP, nothing, no touring, no shows, nothing for a whole year. What are you doing? You've got a Porsche that's sitting in your garage that that has an installment of 30,000. You've got an apartment where you need to pay 12, 15,000. You've got a child somewhere. You've got a family. You've got a career that needs the social lifestyle, the alcohol, the what, the what, the what. What are you going to do for money? You don't have any other skills and most of them don't even go to school. So what are they going to do? And they don't have other um, means of income, whether maybe they go into video editing or yeah. writing, script writing or whatever. They don't have those skills. They just rap or sing or dance. So for a whole year, no income, you're not touring, you're not doing nothing, you are not on, you're not featured anyway. What are you going to do for an income on a monthly basis? Just answer that for me. And then you will tell me if they have got I a mean, price or not. You're describing people with zero skills, so... Exactly. Uh, it's only downhill from there. It's only downhill because you need to maintain this lifestyle that you have showed us. And that's why I respect people who just keep quiet on social media. Where they don't show us where they live. They don't show how much they're making. They don't show us what they're eating on a daily basis. They just keep quiet. Because they don't feel the pressure of always being on top. You get me? Yeah. There are those artists where you like, I only know him for music. Yeah. I don't know where he stays. I don't know why he drives. I don't know who he's married to or dating. Nothing. So you, it's safe to say you yeah. look without fucking up anyone's name or anything like that. You look at some musicians and you're like, I know what the fuck you get up to sometimes. Yes. I look at them and I'm like, oh, please. <laughs> like, just stop lying. What, what hit are you on? What album have you released? What music video do you have? When did you tour? When was your last gig? Yet you wake up, you buy a Range Rover. Like, come on. We're not kids. Like, 
yes, you 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 don't owe us an explanation. Yeah. Granted, but don't lie us about lie to us about working hard when there is no employment. What do you think um, these guys get out of this? The the guys now, the the guys with no, money. No, for them, it's the guys it, with money. I mean, do they want to fornicate? I mean, sex is so beautiful. Yes, they do. <laughs> yes, they do. Why does it get it's, to it, their it, level of defecation and and it's and peeing fetishes? On, do you get satisfaction from that? Yes, shit? they do. But a woman's vagina is nice for me. No, like... they don't care. It's not about a woman's vagina or how sex feels. It's about dehumanizing. It's about power. It's about um, showing off your wealth. It's about entertainment with friends. You're sitting on a boat on a yacht. Yeah. You have exotic girls from America, South Africa, Nigerians, Ghanaians, beautiful girls who are sitting on your yacht. Your yacht costs 90 million. Mm. You've got your other billionaire friends on that yacht. And you just want to prove a point that you've got more money. You do the worst of the worst for laughs and internet entertainment. You pour alcohol on them. You pee on them. Your dogs are sleeping with them. It's just power. Oh, Th yeah. That's all it is. Yeah. It's, like, it's like when rich people take the most expensive um, sports cars and they go crash them. They just speed and race and race and crash them. 20 million gone. For them, it's like, ha, 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 your car was not faster than mine. Yeah. They call the dealership, make me another car. That's all it is. It has nothing to do with, oh, that was a Ferrari. That was a what? They don't give a shit about it because they know they make a hundred times more than the cost of that little Ferrari. It's like them going to Kailami track, racing their BMWs, only to crash and destroy the wheels. They don't care if the wheels are 40,000 rand a tire. They don't care about that. That's the 40,000 rand they use on alcohol. They don't care. And most of that money, it's money they don't want to pay the tax man with. So they pay it in cash. Yeah. So they don't care about how you feel and your sexual enjoyment. If they want sexual enjoyment, they can have the side chicks, the proper side chicks. And their wives and their girlfriends, right? You're not a wife. You're not a girlfriend. You're not a side chick. You're a foreign import that is going in two days. So they want to do whatever it is they can do in two days. Or three days. Or how many days you are there for. So they don't care about you enjoying and you coming and you screaming and, and saying, oh my God, that was a great experience. They don't give a shit about that. It's their egos and how much power they have and what they can show their friends. That's it. That's a sobering realization. They uh, don't care it, about it you. It is what it is. Yeah, I, I get it. You're a product. It. Yeah, because power. Is... They don't even know your name. Sure. Yeah, they don't know how to pronounce your name. You say, you, you get there, you're like, oh, it's Pamandla. And this Arab guy is looking at you like, dude, I don't give a fuck who you are. <laughs> I don't care who you are. I really don't. I don't, I don't want to know who your, who your parents are. I don't want to know if you go to school or not. I don't, nothing, zero. Don't want, I don't want to know. I'll probably not even see you again. So Yeah. All right, before we segue to something else, let's go back to the book a little bit because I think I missed something. Yes. Um, the financial implications you mentioned, yes. how much it costs you as a self-publisher. What are the financial rewards then when you eventually become the best? I actually didn't finish that. Let me just quickly sure. finish that. So you've got the editing fees and the proofreading fees, right? And then you've got the graphic designers who design the covers. Then you... You need to copyright and trademark. So my logo, which is Bear, or the mm -hmm. book of the name, because it became a logo, I had to patent it, right? You can go to Cipro, that's probably like four, five hundred rand. Yeah. But if you go to a intellectual lawyer, intellectual property lawyer, they will charge you a lot of money because they need to file it differently. And there's different clause you can find it under and so forth, right? Then, but that's an option. It's not a necessity. Then you've got the layout and design. So if you open if any book, you can open your willow one. Sure. For an example. So you've got these things. Open Will's book. So it's a design. See, they decided to design it this way. Sure. Right? And then you flip over to the next book. Ugh, this book was designed ugly. Um, let me take you can take it. Do you have mercy? Uh, most of the shit is about football. Take yours. Oh, what, guys? Guys, I dumped my guy who liked football. I'm into basketball. 
Και χάτε την κοιτσί στη λεπέρα. Οκ, cool. So if you look at Mercy, so you've got that sure. design and then you've got that design, two different designs, right? And then you've got that's a disclaimer. You've got that. And then let me show you something like this. So you see different designs. So mm-hmm. these are like poetry or letters or something like that, but you see the framing is different. So there's a specific person you need to pay for that. Yeah. That designs the look and feel and including the cover including the cover okay. right no that's a different pay the layout is different oh, the cover is different in terms of payments mm. two different people and then you've got the printing so the type of paper you use determines costing so if yeah. you use white paper that's cheaper if you use creamy bulky which is more, the more brown color that's more expensive and then the the color grading and the size of the paper also Um, you see those books that have that glossy feel mm-hmm. and then you've got books that have pictures inside. I know it's this inside. different texture of paper. Yes, that's the used paper is different. Pa- the so those also uh, are part of your cost. Printing alone, you're looking at anything between 50 to 200,000 depending, depending on, on the, the number, number of books. books. Yeah. Correct. Um, and then marketing. Yeah. What type of marketing? I use digital, which is social media and online. Um, I don't print things like flyers and stuff like that because I'm like who's going to see waste, the flyers like waste. it's a waste 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 you have an audience that's yeah, connected so to I I I really focus on social media and then obviously you still have print media which is newspapers and magazines and then I do a lot of television podcasts and oh, yeah. radio right yeah. so that is also marketing so depending on if you're able to do it yourself or you can hire a PR manager to assist you with that that's also costing so All in all, for a successful book, you need about two hundred thousand. Then return, depending on how much you sell your book and if it does sell, you're looking at anything between four to five, six hundred thousand. Right, depending on whether or not it's selling. It sell. Yeah, yeah, you can do all of these things and they're still not buying. It could bomb. Yeah. It could. <laughs> Unfortunately, but it's very interesting uh, to say that to give birth to a baby, it could cost you could. anywhere between fifty yeah. hundred, two hundred thousand, depending yeah. on the number of copies you need to number make available copy, yeah. as well. I mean, there are people who just print a hundred copies, two hundred, yeah. but what is the pro- um, the profit on that? You know, where are you selling it? Who's your target audience? Um, but God, I, I think I was just blessed that my audience is young people. Yeah. And some people have grown with me, so they've been there for like five, six years. Um, and now that we are going into different countries, we've got Botswana, Namibia, we've got Ghana, Nigeria. So my audience is really growing. So I do get money from the different countries. Mm. Safe to say that you you've been able to recover. Yes, yes, that's why I can and print it. and create more books. <laughs> nice one. Yeah. Um, question that is escaping me now. Um, oh yeah, because you're not publishing, anyone who wants to convert this into Netflix or a movie, you get a pers- percentage of that. Right? Yes, there's a potential. They, they that buy you could make the money. licensing. Yeah, from yeah. Me. Just explain to us, break so it down. I know that that that, that exists, but yeah. other people don't know that how how it works. So for people who are published with a publishing house, mm. obviously the publishing house owns the rights of the book, so you get a very small percentage mm-hmm. as the writer, right? I'm not under any publishing house, so they need to directly negotiate with me. So they need to buy my name, which is the Jackie Pamuta trademark. They need to also buy trademark of Bay, because Bay is trademark. Mm-hmm. Then they need to pay for licensing. So there's three different streams of income. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Then development. I I generally would not accept if somebody developed my book and I'm not part of the production. Oh yeah, for sure. You need to be an executive so, producer. Yeah, it's either. A supervising EP or supervising yeah. or in the script department or something I would not sell it and I'm not part of it somehow mm. so I would obviously get a payment for mm. being part of the production team what what have you researched and heard is a significant sum of money that someone's was oh there's somebody who got a good seven million out of a, nice a book deal in South Africa yeah wow that's nice yeah they they got that. And then you still have the text man, so <laughs> <laughs> that's fucked up as well. Like yeah, yeah. I, uh, when I, uh, but it's okay, guys. You're getting you're getting plus minus what ten mil. 
And then you pay what, 15, 25% to SARS? Uh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You I, didn't have the money. The point is that money was not there. So oh, yeah, yeah, You can yeah. part with the million, that's, okay? That's what I consoled myself. Yeah, the, you, the you can Yeah, you can part with it. The most significant sum I had to pay to Saz, I'm like, okay, at least, get, okay, I'm, I'm I'm begrudging. Yeah. But the 200,000 I'm giving you, yeah. the actual amount that I was getting, yeah. okay, I, yeah, I, I was not fine. getting it. But it's from my labor, though. It's like, ah, fuck it. Yeah. It's from my labor, It though. sucks. And then you go on the road and you see the portals and you're like, fuck. I wish I didn't give you money. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. Do so, you have any hope, though, that the, any of these could be adapted by We Netflix? are working on it. Nice one. Congratulations. Oh, yeah. good luck. No, the Bad Nation has asked. Like, they were like, oh, my God, we want to see this on Netflix. And I'm like, okay, okay, guys, I need to keep quiet. Like, just shut up. You will see. I, I need to shut up. But we are working on something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, that would be exciting. Yeah. Because um, people want to see all those sex scenes on TV and all the stuff, all the raunchy stuff on television. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I find people interesting. Uh, maybe we can segue to that. The, 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 what you consume as a book reader, I think that's very interesting. I'm 32 and I've literally dedicated my 20s to consuming anything that has to do with what I'm doing. So autobiography is about sports only. Yes. Or practical shit that I can be able to use. So I dropped novels in my teenage years. I loved English, blah, 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 blah. No, but I still read everything. That's the other day I was reading um, the story about Kobe. So basketball. Yes, yes, yes. Kobe Bryant, yeah. Uh-huh. And then I also read crime novels, crime books. But also I'm a student, so I still need to read my academic books. Sure. Um, but wherever I find a book... And I genuinely become fascinated with it. I would read it. Um, the only thing that I'm really not into is financial reports. And I'm like, oh, man, yeah, okay, fine. My accountant can really deal with that. I'm not going to spend 500 rand on an accounting book and just look at the numbers and be like, no. But I, I try to, 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 to read everything that I come across, not not every book is a nice book, honestly speaking. Yeah. But I'm more into biographies, African biographies, yeah. African stories. Um, right now, I have started collecting all great black people, their stories from actors, tech black people, um, people who are in the motor vehicle industry who are black people who have created millions in those industries agriculture black people who have created great things out of agriculture just black history mm. um i've started documenting that and black women who cr changed the na narrative like in many many things like mining tycoons like mama tiffany mashile she's she's in uh, manganese mining um just their biographies and life stories i've started to to collect that mm. because i realized that in 10 15 years those books will disappear and I'm like, what will I ever tell my children to go Google them? Yeah. Like, Google is not accurate. Most Do you of like time. PDF at all? Like, no, I, I don't. I fucking hate it. I, I don't like I PDFs. PDF. I don't like ebooks. I feel sure. like they're so impersonal. I don't want to be staring at my screen for 10 hours and then still doing work and doing my schoolwork. And I, uh -uh. I like a physical copy. Yeah. For an example, see, this chair is so perfect. I'll just literally just sink in and read. I, I really enjoy hard copies. Um, but biographies are my thing. Crime, crime stories, true crime stories are my thing. Um, psychology books are my thing. Sports books. Um, I'm collecting a lot of sports. I, was, I collected Neymar's book. I collected Roger Federer's book. Mm. I am collecting like different kinds of sports, like great mm. people who are good in sport. Just if because you're mentoring, they're very... If you're mentoring anyone, would you encourage them to, to be as diverse as possible? Because yes. there's some people that are fascinated by fiction because it has drama. They're fascinated with yeah, your but... books because it's dramatic. Yeah, it but is. But they could only be honing that aspect of their reading whereas they're missing out on other stuff. It's good to be an all-rounded person. You can't just decide to know one thing maybe if you're just focusing on politics. Yeah. What about technology? What about other people's stories that you could learn from? What about what's happening in the world? What about your own country? What about the people who are building your country? So it's it's good to know a little bit of everything so that you just don't feel ostracized in conversations. For an example, you go to a function, a work function, and people are talking about um, the first black person to build a car. 
are you you have no idea and they're speaking about the first black person to to own shopping malls and you you don't have no idea and then, you know, just be diverse in your reading so that you can also contribute. Mm. Yes, it's great to know one specific thing that is your niche, but be open to learning other things. It's okay to to read 10 of your favorite books, but also read three or four of things that you don't know about. Just mm. find something that you don't know and go research on it. I think one of the things that are frustrating about geeks and bookworms uh, is that generally speaking, the general public doesn't know shit about shit. Yeah. You know, you find that yeah. you're the only person who knows all of this shit. Yeah. So as you're describing the scenario, what you, people are speaking about the first black person to build a car, you would, you, it, it's not perhaps a realistic scenario, even though it should yeah. be. Yeah. You, you know, niggas, not necessarily niggas, but people ain't shit out there because they're not reading as much as they no, should. No, they're not. You know, and you get frustrated as a book geek who would say, oh, okay, cool. You keep all of this information to yourself. And most of the time, you just forget it. Because you're not, ha- you don't but, have a But the good thing engage. about your memory is where, when you're in a certain space, that memory will come back. So when they're talking about you are into sports, the first black person to play in rugby, mm. you will know in that instant. And then they will say, who won Formula One in 2017? You would know. So you might forget it now, yeah. but when the conversation comes, you will, you, know, you will, you will pick, we will pick up the knowledge. Um, but you just don't want to be that person who knows nothing about anything else. I've always feared that shit. Like, uh, I don't want to not know anything about And you're anything. sitting for two hours with people who are te- in tech, who are in communication, who are in media, who are in, and you're the only one in sport. Yeah. So you want to tell me, in all of those people's conversations, there's nothing there's you nothing can, you can say contribute to. Until somebody asks you three hours later about sport. Yeah. You're going to be very embarrassed. Yeah, but it is what it is. Yeah, you're going to be very embarrassed. Yeah. um, I was looking at something dramatic unfolding, myself and a lot of South Africans. uh, It seems as though there is a theological warfare that's happening with pastors who are exposing each other. Uh, Jay Israel has received a lot of traction recently on social media because he's exposing other pastors. And it's very interesting. He's speaking to people who are giving testimonies in church uh, and they are revealing that, of course, the testimony wasn't necessarily real. I mean, I looked at that and I thought, who didn't know in the first place that there was no monkey that suddenly appeared in someone else's wardrobe or that the person was not in a wheelchair bound for 19 years and they suddenly uh, were able to walk on that day? As you watch stuff like that unfold, what do you make of it? Jay Israel versus Pastor Motlala versus Prophet Bushiri and all of that stuff. As it unfolds, what's your thoughts on it? I just, I just think um, false prophecies. You know, when 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 all of these pastors sort of expose each other, mm-hmm. I feel like they buy witnesses so that the testimonies are testimonies. So it's easy to. You're gonna buy have th- to convince me on that because I. So one of the women. Uh-huh. So here's the scenario, okay. right? The pastor is in church, Pastor Mutlala, and he's prophesying that there is a woman who lives, incidentally, p- place where I grew up in Guguletu, and in in their house they practice witchcraft, and one of their pets or one of their one one of the things that they use is a monkey or infant or whatever, yeah. a baboon. And they are in church and then they literally go to this woman's house and they do find this monkey. And no. the woman Those then, things are plotted. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Those things are plotted. Yeah. That's what I'm saying, Uti. When then Pastor J Israel is revealing that that was false, yes. it's because he's speaking to that woman and the woman is revealing what you know, that was not true. And, and that thing negatively affected my life because everyone in my street thought I was a witch. Because they saw it live on television or streamed live on Facebook. I only say everybody has an agenda and an intention. I don't know why he's doing what he's doing or why they are doing what they're doing. But one thing I can tell you is it's competition at the end of the day. Who has the biggest following? Who creates more noise on social media? Who attracts more people in their churches? has nothing to do about the word of God. Nothing. Zero. Zero. You know, um, people are being misled into 
modern Christianity and and modern ways of worshiping mm. and if it was about God, when did they speak about God? When? If your ministry is about God, when do you spend time speaking about God? Or you just spend time exposing things? That's when they talk about God. Come on. Like, even if they're exposing each other, it is to benefit the other. I expose you so that your congregation can come to me. No, no, no. Back and forth. It's not about God. It's not about God. You're not saying, you're not having testimonies where you say, how did we help the people? What do we do for the people? What do we do for this community? You're talking about, we are Seba, about the other one. Hey, you're all you. Would you rather you're have, all sinners in whatever way you look at it. Would you rather have cutting edge doing it instead of another pastor? Yes, yeah, journalists. Let journalists do their job. You are not a journalist. You're there to deliver God's word. Yet you use all your time trying to degrade and expose and judge the other church or the leader of the other church. What is your role? If you say you're a pastor, be that. God will reveal the other people in their ways. And people know the truth. If you go to a church and you are healed, you will know the truth that you were healed. If you are not healed, you will leave. You will leave. So you still have faith, Ugo, to, there is the the there is the power of spirit where people go to church wheelchair bound and they go home yes. walking. Yes. God does do miracles. He does. It's just that we don't speak about it. And those who have been healed don't speak about it. And maybe they don't have access to social media the way we do. But I, I didn't see this pastor say when it was raining in case it ended, did they donate anything? I didn't see them say, oh, we are healing this COVID or whatever. Who are they healing? They're not having mass gatherings where they're praying for people. But they, they're calling each other out? Like, really? That is so petty. Like, yes, so what? Because every church, let me tell you this, every church, especially these evangelist churches, these charismatic churches, they all have these scandals, all of them, all of them. It's either, it's, it's pee in olive oil, they buy mass olive oils, there's no prayers in those things, they send in people bank cards to put money. Like, it's all these stupid, stupid, stupid gimmicks. And I'm just saying, if you claim to be a pastor, what work are you doing as that? Or your job is to expose other people. God will do that. If you're a prayerful person, God will expose things himself. You don't need to be on a witch hunt or a manhunt for other people or to get congregates from the other church your focus should be on the people now you're going to have somebody on your live or your youtube or whatever exposing the other pastor only for you to get lawsuits to get death threats start killing each other oh yeah he's, yeah. he's received death threats. only to get all of that nonsense all of when are you actually doing the god's work that, that is not god's work god didn't ask you to go expose people your assignment is to lead the church. How are you leading the church? So I don't believe in all that nonsense. Mm. I just feel like egos, they want to destroy each other's churches. They want to grow their own following. It has nothing to do with the people. It has nothing to do with God or healing or restoration. It's just, how do I get more views? What is the next big story I'm going to expose? What is the next big thing I'm going to say? They can't post that they went to KZN to kill help people. To help help. They didn't do that. During COVID, when people were hungry, what church, which church donated except ZCC? ZCC donated millions to people of the Bobo. What did they do? Nothing. Where were they? Where are they now? Where? So, so, all of these churches and their leaders, 
they have so many agendas for themselves to only enrich themselves. As you see these things playing out, does it not then erode the trust of the church? I don't trust modern churches. I don't. I go to church where my grandmother goes to church. That church has been there for 100 years. They sing, they read the Bible, they go one hour, 30 minutes, is done. There's no pictures, there's no videos, there's no cameras, nothing. You don't go live on Facebook? No. For what? To show who? And then when they see that to I went to church. The and they, no, the word of God will find people's God's people, you will find them. They know where to find it. God was in Mark Zuckerberg's heart when he created Facebook ah, so that his word can be shared across the world. Uh-uh, guys. There's always some counter argument. Uh-uh, guys, uh-uh. can we not be misled? Yeah. Like you, The word of God exists in all of us. You know where you are happy. You know, you know when you go to some churches, you feel numb in the church. You even forget that you're in the church. You just think of what time can I go, you know? But there are some churches where you sit there, you hear and feel every word, and you feel like coming back. And that has always been my grandmother's church. It's a very simple church, old. The building is old. We sit on plastic chairs. There are no cameras. There are no fi- fancy faces. You go to the bathroom outside there by the wall there, there by David Lee. You see, you come out, you talk about God, you talk about your faith. They pray for you, the elders. You go. All right. Um, I really appreciate you and the conversation. Um, As we summarize our conversation then, um, I want to ask you a couple of things. Yes. Number one, uh, you said something very interesting to me about Kevin Samuels. Mm -hmm. Um, He passed away recently, and I did not hear black women saying flattering things about him. Uh, for various reasons. Uh, for me, I learned a lot from him. I don't like consuming relationship content, but the little that I saw yeah. was empowering for me as a brown person in this world that hates brown people, particularly brown men. What did you make of his content and what do you make of all the reaction to his content now that he's dead? He was a straightforward guy. He said what he wanted to say and he meant it. How you react to it, that's personal opinion. Um, yes, obviously some topics were a bit um, borderline on the edge, mm. but that's what his pl- platform was about. He wanted to t- tackle issues. He wanted to question intention in relationships. And he was very clear on his stance. If you like the way he delivered the message, great. If you didn't like it, you didn't like it. And you're not going to die. No, he was just, yeah, he was just... One of those people who just said what he meant. And if he didn't like it, he didn't like it. But people followed him. So there were people who liked him. So It's very weird as well because you're a content creator. I'm a content creator. We're all content creators. And one of the things that we always ask ourselves is, if this shit offends you so much, why, why the are you fuck still are you following? always here yeah, exactly. all the so, time? Like, exactly. Why are you here all why the time? You, you know, there, there are so many people who... And this comes from personal experience who would say, I don't like Jackie. Jackie's like this. They, number one, they've never met me. Number two, they probably won't meet me. <laughs> um, number three, if my content irritates you so much, why do you pay attention to, to it so much? I don't, I don't follow anyone. Yeah, I don't wh- like. Why do you feel you have to have, have an opinion on what I say yeah. all the time? I only say... There are so many people in the world that I don't know about because I choose not to yes. know about them. You I don't follow me? anyone. I don't, I don't have to follow them. I, I did, so many, so many. People will say, oh, this one is popular there. This so one is popular. What? I'm like, dude, I've never even heard of that person because they're not part of the content that I consume. Mm. They're just not in my life. Like, I don't even see how they affect me. So, therefore, I have no opinion about them. So, then you have people will say, oh, yeah, but you, you're always in a most trending topics mm. whatever, so we are forced to I'm like nobody mm. forces you to do anything the TV can be on but nobody forces you to watch you can change the channel okay so um, I like people who are straight shooters just shoot from your hip and say what you mean and stand by what you mean yep. how if people don't like it they don't like it and it's okay we're not here to, to, to suck your ass like if you don't like it you don't like it yep. there are so many people who, who have told me straight out that well we don't agree with your content or we don't agree with what you have written and so forth. And I respect that if they say it respectfully. 
but you cannot go out of your way to attack me consistently and bully me because you feel like you don't like me. That's when I just block you. I do. I block so many people on a daily basis where I, I literally even forget how many people I block yeah. because I just feel like, number one, you have not read my content. You're not consistent with my content, so you don't even know what I speak about. Number three, you're probably, probably just projecting, so I'm not going to receive There's it. something is wrong with you. Yeah, so I'm definitely not going to receive it. Um, and then there are people who give me positive critique. So they will read my book and say, hey, chapter 9 and 10, I don't agree. Chapter 7, great. I liked that and that and that. Oh, I didn't see this coming. That was a good twist. Oh, no, no, no. Those things I love. But even with that, Jackie, um, we have another channel that is followed by a lot of South African football fans, uh, hundreds of thousands of them. And I'm a creator. I create that shit and you consume it. How you react to it is none of my business. Even with that, when someone is specifically telling you in chapter nine, whatever, yes, we need to get feedback and you need to be humble enough to receive feedback. But I'm like, I'm a creator. I don't respond to it. I'm like, yeah, I sure. Okay. Yeah. Like, I also the thing choose. Is I, I need to create. I yeah. Need to I make also money. choose what I respond to. Yeah. You yeah. know, I, I will not spend my time responding to everything. I don't. I will not do that. I really don't have time for it, and I don't want to give that much energy to stuff like that. But when I feel like, man, I could have done better here, they pointed this out. Sure. I take it very quickly. Yeah. But there are people who just send feedback for just so that you notice them, and I'm like, ah, oh, dude, something is wrong. That, with that, that that means nothing. Do you do you have any insight, perhaps, as you because we go through these things and maybe you think about it, maybe you, you think of something bright to say to that. Mm -hmm. What what creates a person? What makes a person gravitate towards the things that they don't like? I because I mean I don't understand it, and I don't try to understand it because from my personal experience, even if there are a thousand things that people are complimenting that are, are good, if I see five seconds of it, I'm like, nah, fuck it, it's not creatively good enough for my taste. I will never watch it again, and I won't even comment on it because I know it's not designed for me. Why people, do you think it, some people gravitate towards things people that don't like? People create enemies in their heads and they want to focus on their enemies. Do you understand what I'm saying? Yeah. A person who doesn't even know you, but to you they're your enemy. And you create this illusion of them in your head and you obsess over them. Um, it's like people who say they heard Oprah. I'm like, this woman has never even met you. They don't care about you. But you're spending 10 hours watching their video just to critique how horrible she is. And I'm like, okay, whatever. Like, come on. You lead such an empty life that you obsess over somebody that will never even know your name. Like, how pathetic is that? Like, that's why I try not to consume too much of content to a point where I feel like I do not know what I'm doing in my own life. Mm. So I prefer structure. I know at what time I need to do what, at yeah. what time I do. So that my mind is not idling. To a point where I start following my enemies and start stalking my enemies and start stalking my exes. And, you know, it's funny things like that. Because it comes from that. If your life is full and you're content with where it's going, you have no business in following things that do not interest you. There's no time for that. So I fill up my day with a lot of things, whether it be sports, gym, hiking, playing tennis, reading, studying, writing, watching my favorite documentaries, traveling, having drinks with my friends, then I don't have time to stalk you. Yeah. I don't. Because immediately when I leave this meeting, I go to a podcast. After a podcast, I'm on a flight. After a flight, I'm studying. It's exam time. After that, I want to watch a movie with my partner. After that, I'm thinking, let me go do some research. After that, I go to do my charity events. I don't have time to Google and stalk you. As a matter of fact, I must probably have would have blocked you by now. Like mm. I, if you're not in my close circle and I feel like you have no business to be in my life, I block you, so that I don't have the urge to go look at anything that you do. Yeah. Even if I'm bored, I will not look at it because you're blocked. Yeah. Um, as a parting shot, then um, you've written nine books. <laughs> nine. That's fucking fascinating. <laughs> and you are in your early thirties. Yes. That's fucking fascinating. Started writing when I was 25. So you wrote a book per year? Yeah, I do that. I write a book a year. And last year I released four books. 
one adult book, one adult adult book, and three children's book books. You're very prolific. Yeah. Is it easy to love you? No, absolutely not. I know. Not. I'm not my type. I wouldn't date myself. Yeah. <laughs> Me too. I wouldn't. I'm definitely you become not a loner. Type. Oh no, you need to I create. wouldn't. Yeah, yeah. My creativity takes most of my existence. And when I'm in that space, you cannot penetrate me at all. Like you need to, I don't know, even when people, when people died during COVID, I didn't go to funerals. So I was writing, so I could still not get out of my writing zone. Um, When I'm writing, I'm really writing. Nothing else matters. It's either I lock myself in or I travel and you will not find me. My phone will be off. I'll send you a text to say, hey, I'm good. Check you in two days' time, sharp. A week, hey, I'm good. I'm still alive. I'm still busy. Check you in a week's time, sharp. Then you know that I'm okay, but you'll not find me. Writing takes over my life, and then research takes over my life, and then school and assignments and and many other things take over my life. So for you to be in my life, you really have to be very sure why you're there. And and, and you, (laughs) poor thing, shame. Oh, shame, poor thing. You... It, it you have to have your own life, so that when I'm not there, you don't feel that I'm not. It should there. always be like that. Then, yeah. in Anyways, it should always be yeah. like that. In anyways, it's tragic to yeah. know that partners uh, live vicariously through their partners. You you are no, mostly my, my partner. If I'm writing and I'm like I'm going to KZN for two weeks, he's like okay, sharp. And then in five days he rocks up. He's like oh okay. I it's a weekend. I came to see you. I'm gonna have breakfast with you. I'm like, wow, you're such an ass, but I'm happy that you're here. Mm. But because he's got his own life, he's able to cover up for the five days that I'm not there. And then when he wants to come, he know he can come for like the day or whatever. But a person does not have their own life put together every five seconds they're seeking your attention to a point where you can't exist in your own yeah. life, you know? Um so I'm very blessed that I've got somebody who has their own life, who's comfortable with their own life, and when they do want to be part of my in part of my life, they show up, they come. You know, when I know, okay, I'm done, I can always go fit into his life because I know what he's doing and how his life is scheduled, so I can fit in. I don't have to now run after my partner as if I'm sucking on his breast. If he's working, he's working. If I'm working, if I'm writing exams, if I want, if I need to do, sometimes he is in the car with me when I go do my research and he drives me around and I go interview people and I do my charity work and he is there, but he doesn't have to be there. You know, it's per invite. If, can you come? Are you available? Yeah. How is your life? You know, no, I'm busy. I'm doing that. I can see you and your stuff on Sunday. Great. Cause he's got a life. I don't want somebody who's going to leech on me. Yeah. You know, um, and we respect each other's careers and we're good with it. And he's, and I do believe he's very proud of mine as I am of his. And I want him to thrive in his. And for him to thrive, he needs time to do his thing. He will not thrive if he's sitting next to me 24 hours. He will not. And he's definitely going to irritate me. Yeah. Oh, Trina, 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 Trina. Yes. I'm so sorry. It's uh, okay. I, I wanted to part the parting shot to be this one. No? Yes. You've written or you've taken something that was written by someone else. But obviously on your socials, you've written fake it till you make it. But be careful not to blur the line between the fake life. I'm paraphrasing. Yeah. That, between the fake life that you live and your true self. Yes. Um, maybe let's finally, finally close the episode with that. With that, you expanding on that. Fake it till you make it, but be very careful yeah. not to blur the lines between yourself, yeah. your true self and your fake uh, like, facade that you put yeah, up it, it goes back to how we live on social media faking lifestyle faking accomplishments faking satisfaction faking happiness faking existence but don't let that fake lifestyle exceed what you're actually really living don't let that be everything because also the saying of fake it till you make it comes from you faking to be something mm-hmm until you become that thing, right? But don't live in this illusion that to a point where you, you've been faking all your life. You must get to a point where you realize the reality of your life. Am I still working hard? Am I achieving? Am I 
living the way that I'm saying I'm living? Am I comfortable with my success? Am I really working or I'm just faking and pretending to be working? You know, there are people who just go to restaurants and say, oh, I had a successful meeting, but you were there for four hours drinking. That was not a meeting. That means you were not productive. You lied about a meeting that nothing happened. So you're faking a business life that does not exist. That's why in five years time, you have not created any successful business because for the last five years, you've been faking to have a business. So there are no records of your business growing or not because you were just faking to have a business. You know, people say, I, work, I went on a work trip. They are, you have yielded no results from that travel. No, I was, I was doing research. Have you produced articles? Have you written? Have you, have you qu- finished your qualification? I was doing, but you were just talking about it. It never materialized because you were living in this illusion for the longest time. You know, um, this is why I love sports people. You can't fake being a sports person. You can't fake to winning the Olympics. You yeah. can't fake being the best runner. You can't fake being the best car driver. You can't fake that. The results are there. When you say you're training, it will show up in the competition if you were training or not. That's why I enjoy watching sports because that, that, that you can't fake. But people can fake lifestyle. People can fake education. People can fake wisdom. People can fake li- how they dress, how they speak, where they live. They can say, oh, I live in clear water. I live in Waterfall. I live in Bryanston, where they live here in Bruffertine with all of us. Y- you get me? So don't fake things to a point where you don't know the bridge. You just don't know when to cut it off. So... That's my part too. Thank you for much. Thank you so much for having me. Boom.